Well, good morning. As Roger said, I'm Pastor Kelly. I want to also welcome you here this morning. If you have a Bible with you, you could take it and turn to the book of Deuteronomy. We are continuing to work our way through this wonderful book. I trust that you have been blessed as we have done so. Much of what uh, we will be working through will be up on the screen as we read through this together, but uh, sometimes it's just helpful to have your own text and to be working through that as well in your hard copy. But uh, uh, we, we are one to be faithful to the Word of God and to explain and work through what He has to say to us. And in saying this, I want to make clear that uh, my role here is not to give you my opinion about stuff. That's not what I'm called to do. Um, you ought not, I mean, you can, you can value my opinion for what it is, right? Um, there are lots of other opinions out there uh, that may be more valuable than mine, but my, that's not my job. My job is actually to expound the Word of God to you and to explain to you what it is that the Lord is saying to us. And, and uh, I'm so grateful for your prayers in this because that's an overwhelming task and one that I, I understand to be uh, very heavy and one in which I am continuing to go before the Lord and plead for help. And I also want to say that there are times when I will be wrong. Um, I've said this before. I continue to say it. Uh, I'm 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 a man, and this is uh, an overwhelming task. And there are going to be times when I misspeak or I'm wrong. And so um, we want to be careful in the way that we're listening. Um, I'm not the ultimate judge and and arbiter of what God's word says. His he he is the one who is true and faithful. And and we want to be together searching and understanding what the scriptures have to say. And you ought to be holding me accountable in that respect. So there is this mutual exchange between you and me where we work together to make sure that the word of God is accurately and, and faithfully held forth. Uh, by the way, I've said this before too, and it's worth uh, noting again that no, uh, when you stand before the Lord uh, one day and give an account for your life, it will not be sufficient for you to say, yes, but Kelly said. Okay, You're going to stand before the Lord, you and him together, and he'll say, yes, but you, what did you come to understand? So as we look at Deuteronomy, as uh, we think about this together, this is a renewal of covenant. The covenant was given, as Roger alluded to, at Sinai, uh, to the people on that mountain with, with signs and wonders and earthquakes and all of this, uh, this manifestation of God's power and glory. And now the people are poised at the edge of the promised land, uh, looking westward toward uh, Jordan or across the Jordan, in anticipation of taking this land, and Moses is wanting to renew the covenant that they had made with the Lord back 40 years ago earlier. And so that's what Deuteronomy is about. But it has massive implications for you and me today. There's much in this book that actually looks forward to our relationship with the Lord and and ultimately to Christ himself. And so hopefully as we continue to work through this, we'll see that. So as we're uh, talking today, I suppose I should turn that on. As we're talking, we're talking about this, this concept of stop, consider, and understand. And this is something that uh, I think that our culture needs to hear because we live in this fast-paced world in which it's difficult to stop. Now, I'm not talking about stopping at a stoplight. Lord willing, you do that. I'm talking about stopping your thoughts, stopping how you're engaged, and considering. Taking time to stop, to give consideration to something and for the purposes of understanding it, or at least understanding at a deeper level. And that's, that's really what we're talking about. And that's what Moses is doing in this section of Scripture that he is working through with these people. He's saying, listen, stop. Now I want you to consider, and I want you to understand something. In fact, actually, as we'll see, this command to consider is actually a command to know something, understand it. Stop, understand this. Okay, so that's what we're working through. But but there's this concept of uh, being cross-eyed. It's actually a command. Be cross-eyed. Now, what, you, what in the world, Kelly? Be cross-eyed. Well, if, if we live this way, it'd look a little odd, but we would have one eye turned to the past, looking back at what God has done, and one eye turned to the future, anticipating what he will do. And that will allow me to live right now. Okay, so we're to live cross-eyed. He, and this is what Moses is wanting them to do. He's wanting them to be cross-eyed. Look back at what God has done. Remember, 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 remember. And look ahead to what he will do. Look ahead, look ahead, look ahead. And this is how we live life. The Christian life is really summed up in God's, in this whole uh, Exodus experience for his people. As you and I think about this, the gospel is displayed there when it says that God redeemed his people from the slavery of Egypt. 
Well, how does that apply to you and me? He's redeemed you and me from the slavery of sin and from the oppression and the rule of this evil one. And he is moving us forward toward this promised land that he has held out to us. And right now he's at work to sanctify you and to make you holy. And that's, that's really the gospel in a very simple nutshell, right? All right. We're going to read through this, by the way. We're going to read through all of Deuteronomy chapter 11. It's going to take me about five minutes. So, uh, Lord willing, we'll, uh, we'll, I'll, I won't stumble and, and make this, uh, but hopefully uh, you will appropriate this as we go. So I just want to give you a heads up as we work through this together. And uh, I think it's healthy for us to read Scripture together. So follow along while I read. Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments always. And consider today, since I'm not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to all his land. And what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and to their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them as they pursued after you and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day and what he did to you in the wilderness until you came to this place and what he did to Dathan and to Abiram, the sons of Eliab, son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households, their tents, and every living thing that followed them in the midst of all Israel. For your eyes have seen all the great works of the, of the Lord that he did. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you're going over to possess. And that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them and to your offspring. A land flowing with milk and honey for the Lord, for the land that you are entering to take possession of it is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of your of the Lord, your God are always upon it. From the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the later rain that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. He will give grass for your fields, for your livestock, and you shall eat and be full. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house and when you're walking by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. For if you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all his ways and holding fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads shall be yours. Your territory shall be from the wilderness to the Lebanon and from the river the river Euphrates, to the Western Sea. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you shall tread as he promised you. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandment of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. 
but turn aside from the way that I'm commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it, you shall set the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not beyond the Jordan, west of the road, toward the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who live in the Arabah, opposite Gilgal, beside the Oak of Morah? For you are to cross over the Jordan to go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And when you possess it and live in it, you should be careful to do all the statutes and the rules that I am setting before you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is life to us. It is instruction to our souls. Lord, even the reading of it is beneficial to us. Now, Lord, as I turn to preach, would you allow me to speak that which is true from this word? And Lord, would you open up our ears to hear from you Lord, we confess our utter dependence upon you. Lord, as we listened in on this discourse between these blind men and Jesus, as they cried out, Lord, we want you to open our eyes. We confess that our understanding, our open eyes is your work. So Lord, would you open up our eyes? I pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so what's the central thought this morning? Stop, consider, and understand who the Lord is and how he cares for his people, and you will love and obey him gladly. Now, we could put an if there. If you will stop and consider and understand who the Lord is and how he cares for his people, you will love and obey him gladly. But the point is that it's going to require us to stop. It's going to require us to give some consideration, and and then it's going to require us to understand But if we will do this, if we will stop, consider, and understand, this is what's going to aid us and contribute to our obedience and our love for him, which those two concepts, obedience and love, go together, and they go together such that my obedience is glad. I'm happy to obey him because I love him. So let's work this through together. Uh, Let's look again at Deuteronomy 11, verses 2 through 4, and look at this idea of considering or understanding. He says, and consider today... Since I am not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it, consider the discipline of the Lord your God. And then he goes on. He says, oops, excuse me. There we go. Consider. Consider. This is a command to us. It's a command that, that implies stop, right? You're thinking about something else. Stop thinking about that something else and give consideration to this now. Stop. Consider. Today, right now, stop, consider, right now, today. Now, there is this strange statement where he goes on and he says, since I'm not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it. And this is a little bit difficult to translate. It says, what does he mean here? What's he talking about? This is what I think he's wanting to say to these people. It's not as though what he's saying doesn't apply to their children. That's not what he's saying. But instead, what he's saying is, you, here, Now, you should know this. You've experienced this. You, here, now, stop, consider. Yes, your children are going to need to do this too. In fact, you're going to need to teach them. But you, right now, stop, consider. And this is a message for us. And I just want to throw it right here at the beginning. Are there times in your life where you you stop and you consider? You meditate. You give thought to who God is and what he's doing. You look back, you look forward, and there's intentional time to stop and consider. This is for you and me today, right now, right here, today. Do this is what he's saying to them. So stop and consider. Well, let's consider first, he's saying to them and to us to consider the Lord's discipline. So consider the Lord's discipline. There's a series of things that he wants us to consider, and he begins here. Consider today. Consider what? Well, consider the discipline of the Lord. Consider the discipline of the Lord. And this is actually a command that is also to say, understand the discipline of the Lord. So don't just think about it, but think about it for the purposes of understanding it. Know the discipline of the Lord. Look back, think about it, and understand it. His discipline is instruction to us, isn't it? Now, we often think of discipline as punishment. 
Um, often, in fact, we confuse these two things. We think about disciplining our kids. Oftentimes, that gets kind of conflated with punishing our kids. But discipline is not punishment. Discipline is instruction. It's, it's an act of love. It's the Lord coming alongside. And actually, we get the word discipling from it. The Lord is discipling his people. So consider the Lord's discipline. And I think there's two things that he says explicitly here that they need to consider that help us. First, he says, consider what I did to Egypt. So he's saying to them, consider what the Lord did to Egypt. Well, what did he do, right? Consider the discipline of the Lord, your God, his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. Consider his greatness, his mighty hand and his outstretched arm. So here's look back and see the power of your God. See his greatness in this mighty outstretched arm as it was manifested in what he did in Egypt. Why is this important to them? Because they're about to go into a land with people bigger and powerful and stronger than they are. So look back and see God's mighty hand so that as you look ahead to what the Lord is doing, you won't fail to trust him. Look back and consider. Consider what? Consider his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt. Well, what were these signs and deeds? Let's work through this real quickly. Consider his signs and his deeds that he did in Egypt, what he did to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, what he did to all of his land. Now, what are we thinking about together here? We're thinking about the plagues, right? We're thinking about what God did. And he did it to Pharaoh and he did it to the land, right? And what he did to the army of Egypt, this is later, and how he made the water of the Red Sea flow over them. So he's going back to this whole Exodus experience all the way back to when Moses shows up and says, let my people go. And the Lord begins to demonstrate his power over them. By the way, all of those plagues that the Lord brought on Egypt were specific to the gods that they worshiped. And so the Lord is actually showing them, I have power and might over these very gods that those Egyptians serve and I have power and might over the gods of those people. You're going into this land in which you're going, these Canaanites. What was God teaching them? He's teaching them a couple of things. First, he was teaching them that he is the Almighty. Who is he? He is the Almighty. Again, we see that in verse 2. Consider his greatness, his mighty hand, his outstretched arm. Consider your powerful, mighty God. Second. He's he's secondly teaching them that he is the only sovereign God. There is no other. I am the only one. Consider what he did to Pharaoh and to all of Egypt and all of their gods, to this sovereign ruler who was over you at that time, this one that you served. Look what God did to him. Look what he's going to do to all of these kings. He alone is the sovereign God. And then he wants to teach them that he will fight for them. He will fight for them. This powerful one. Consider how he destroyed the Egyptian army in the sea. Remember, look back. So, by the way, if you function cross-eyed in the way that I'm talking about, literally, you'll, you'll, you'll stumble and trip. But if you function spiritually in a cross-eyed way, you'll actually walk in faith and in hope. Right? Because you'll be looking back and saying, who is this one? Mighty. Powerful. What did he do overthrew them? What will he do for me? He's going to fight for me. So consider what he did to Egypt, but consider also what he did to you in the wilderness. So he's saying to these people, listen, I want you to think back on what happened to you in the wilderness. Now, granted, most of these were young at the time when they were put into the, the wilderness, but they were out there for 40 years, right? And so the ones who were brand new infant born at the time when, when they, they didn't go in originally and were sent out are 40 years age, of age right now. So they experienced all of this together. Consider what he did. Consider the discipline of the Lord and specifically what he did to you in the wilderness. Consider what he did. But what did he do? Deuteronomy 8, 2. And you shall remember the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. And what were some of the ways in which the Lord tested them? 
They didn't have water. They didn't have food. It was hot. There were serpents. There were all of these nasty things happening. There's, there's difficulty and struggle. Imagine that you, there's, there's, there's at least 600,000 people, if not over a million people in this group. Imagine that you, you're like in the back. And Moses and the other leaders are way up there in the front. And you're wondering, what's going on? What's going on? Where are we going? Our kids don't have water. We don't have food. What's happening? What kind of faith would it take to say, you know what? I, I trust the Lord. I trust in, in how he's doing this to me. So we, we give them a bad time because oftentimes, oh, look at how, how much they stumbled. Well, imagine that you're in their circumstance, hungry, tired, and thirsty, and your kids are crying. And you have no idea what's going on a mile ahead of you. What was God teaching them? Well, he was teaching them that he disciplines those whom he loves. He disciplines those whom he loves. Deuteronomy 8, 5 and 6. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you. He was teaching you just as a man disciplines his son. And what's the conclusion that we draw from that? Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways and to fear him. He was teaching you. He was showing you. So obey him. Follow him. What else was he teaching them? That he is holy and righteous. He is holy and righteous. Verse 1. And keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, and his commandments. Now, how? why am I linking that to his holiness and righteousness? The law of God is righteous because he is righteous. The law cannot be separated from God himself. Do not separate the law from God. The law actually teaches us about the character and the beauty and the greatness of God. The Ten Commandments are actually held out to us to display and demonstrate to us the character of our God. Do not murder. Why? Because God is kind and loving and he would never murder. So the law cannot be separated away from God himself. And this is why love of God cannot be separated from obedience to God. Because I'm not disobeying a law. I'm not disobeying a thing. I'm, I'm walking away from a person, from God himself. Love and obedience are intimately connected because the law is a representation of God himself and his character. You shall therefore love the Lord because it's his charge and his statutes and his rules. Now, sometimes, please don't do this. I've done this. Please don't do this. Because sometimes we'll say, well, why should you, why should you do this? They say, well, because God says so. Because God says so. There's a way in which what we're subtly communicating is that there's this statement, this rule that God has given that is separate from him. Why should we do this? Why should we obey? Because God is who he is. Because he is beautiful and righteous and you're created in his image. And, and he loves you and you should love him. Love him. That's why we obey. That's just because he said it. He said it because it's true and it's good. All right. Consider the discipline of the Lord. Consider what I did to you in the wilderness and all of these things. And, but look at what he did with Dathan and Abiram. Dathan and Abiram. Now we're going to come back and explain this in just a moment. But I want to show what God was teaching in this circumstance with Dathan and Abiram. Be careful. The Lord is holy and obedience is not a secondary or casual matter. Listen to me, people. And this is a message for you and me today. Even those of us who are in Christ. Listen, be careful. Obedience to Jesus Christ is not a secondary or casual thing. God is holy. How do we see this in this text? What did he do to Dathan and Ibiram? Well, the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up. 
earth opened up its mouth. Imagine that you were all around. So what has happened here is Dathan and Abiram have rebelled against Moses' leadership and ultimately against God. And why did they do that? Because Moses was applying the law. A man had gone out to gather some wood on the Sabbath day. And he was discovered working on the Sabbath day. And so this was brought to Moses. And they said, Moses, what should we do? And Moses said, stone that man. And they did. And Korah and Dathan and Abiram and 250 others said, whoa, wait a minute. You're going too far here. You are going too far. And they pushed back against Moses' leadership. And what happens? Not, not right then, but the Lord Moses calls them together to come before the Lord. And in front of their tents, the Lord, or the, the, the earth, opens up its mouth and swallows them up with their households and their tents and every living thing that followed them. Picture this for a moment. Here you are. And you're all gathered together. And you have these people pushing back. This is, you've gone too far, Moses. You've gone too far. And the Lord tells Moses, said, get those people away from, from Dathan and Abiram. Move them away. And so the people go, okay. And so they all move away and back up, except for these 250. And the earth trembles and it opens up. And these people go down in, every one of them, everything. And you're standing there going, wow. This is kind of important. God is holy. This matters. This obedience thing, not just a casual thing. God is holy. Stop and consider. Stop and consider, though, his promises. Stop and consider his promises. So consider first his promise to provide for you. That's what he's saying to these people. Consider that God has promised to provide for you. He loves you. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong and go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, and that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, and to their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. Go take possession of the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them. He promised a land to them. I'm going to give it to you. Go take it. He promised. Go take it. Remember, consider, stop. He promised. And then remember who he is. Is he a, is he a promise-keeping God? Does he keep his promises? Then go take the land. He promised it to you. Remember what he promised. He said he would provide a land flowing with milk and honey, a provision of a fruitful land. This is going to be awesome, guys. This is going to be wonderful. It's going to be flowing with milk and honey. That's just a reference to produce. Plenty of healthy goats and livestock producing milk and plenty of of flowers and produce for the bees to produce good honey. God cares for his people, not only by providing a place for them, but a good and abundant place. I think it's helpful for us to pause for just a moment and hear Jesus say, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. What kind of place will that be? It will be a good and abundant place. For the land that you are entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come. It is not like the land of Egypt. So I want you to, he's saying, I want you to consider the goodness of this land and I want you to compare it to where you came from. It is not like the land of Egypt. It's not like it in that when you, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it. And it's like a garden of vegetables. What he's saying is back there in Egypt, remember that? You had to irrigate the land. So it's like dry land, uh, the difference between produce, uh, produce, pro- productive farmland today that doesn't need irrigation and those that will produce nothing unless you put pivots out there. Right? This is pivot-driven land. This is irrigated land. You needed to irrigate this. That's not like this. It's not like that. Pause here for just a second because I want you to consider the irony of what Dathan and Abiram say. Going to number 16 in verses 12 and 13, let's read. And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up 
Is it a small thing that you've brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you must also take yourself or make yourself prince over us? You have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey. They're thinking back to Egypt. Egypt was this land flowing with milk and honey in their minds. We think, oh, that's crazy. Are you familiar with Keith Green? Keith Green used to have a song. It has a song. So, so you want to go back to Egypt? Well, listen, before we get too critical of these Israelites, consider your forgetfulness. Consider how often you forget what the Lord has done in your life. For, forget how you forget how things you, you misremember. Oh, it was wonderful back then. Was it really? All right. He says, consider the goodness of the land. It's not like the land of Egypt. What is it like? But the land you're going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys. A land that the Lord, your, your God, cares for. He cares for it because he cares for you. He cares for it because he cares for you. He loves you. And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give the rain for your land in its season. He will provide the rain for your land that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil who provide produce from the land. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock. This is where that milk is coming from. Healthy livestock. And you shall eat and be full. You will have an abundance overflowing. This is God's promise to you. This is what he's holding out to you. Here's what we look forward to. Look back. Remember what God has done. Look forward to this abundance that God is providing. Their promised land is an illustration and foretaste of the land promised to you. This is where you and I, as New Testament believers, as gospel believers in Jesus Christ, look back at what God did in Egypt or in Israel and how he promised them a land and what that land would be like and calls us to remember that the Lord says, I go to prepare a place for you. There is a land that I am at work to give to you. And what will that land be like? Think of that. This blessed hope that we have where Christ is present with his people. Stop and consider that your issues, that is your struggles, are related to your view of God and whether he, his promises to you are good and whether he'll keep them. But you think about this for a minute, where you struggle with fear, doubt, worry, where you struggle with anger, where you struggle with discontentment, what you're actually struggling with is your conception of God himself, what his promises are to you and whether he's going to keep them and whether they're good. If you understand God's goodness and his promise, then the temporary right now will fall away increasingly as I think about his future promise to me. It was rough in the wilderness. What did they need to do? Promised land. Promised land. What do we need to do? Promised land. Promised land. Because it's rough in the wilderness. All right. We consider his promises to provide. We consider his promises to prevail for you. We'll work through this quickly. And if you will be careful to do all that I command, that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and holding fast him, then the Lord will drive out these nations before you. He will prevail for you. He will prevail for you. And you will dispossess the nations greater and mightier than you. You'll prevail because of him. He's going to do it. You're going to do it. You're going to do it because he's going to do it. Did you get that? He's going to do it. You're going to do it. You're going to do it because he's going to do it. No one shall be able to stand against you. Does this, does this, does this hearken forward to something that you think about in the New Testament? Who can stand against God's elect? Who can bring a charge? Who can, who can tear down? If you belong and have justified by Christ, what do you have to fear? God will prevail for you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you and all the land that you shall tread. Why? Because he promised it. Because he promised it. He will prevail for his people. 
he will prevail for you. As you think about our world, and I know that in, in our Christian kind of culture today, there are many who are concerned about the future. We're concerned about what's going to happen two weeks from now in an election and thinking what will happen and what will happen if, as the world continues to shift away from a, a value of religious liberty, what will happen? You know what's going to happen? The Lord will prevail for his people. You and I have nothing to fear. You and I stand because of what Christ has done for us. And this world is wilderness. But there's a promise and he will accomplish it. He will prevail. No matter what happens tomorrow or next week or in three weeks or next year. Stop, consider, and understand who it is that has promised to fight for you. Who is this one who has promised to fight for you? All right, lastly, uh, this isn't last. Sorry. Consider the Lord's judgments. Let's quickly work through this. Consider the Lord's judgments. Consider how he's going to judge the righteous. Consider how he's going to judge the righteous. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. The blessing if you obey. This is a blessing for the righteous. Let's look at this blessing for the righteous. What is it? If you obey, keep the whole commandment that I command you today, you will be strong and you will go in and take possession of the land that you're going over to possess. And that you'll live long in the land. If you obey, you'll live long in the land. If you will indeed obey my commands, he will give the rain for your land in its season. If you will indeed obey my commands today to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, he will give grass in your fields for your livestock and you shall eat and be full. Praise God that his blessings to you now, his blessing to you now does not depend upon you keeping the law now. Praise God, his blessing now does not depend upon you keeping the law. We saw this in our catechism question and in the text that we looked at earlier. Romans 10.4, we'll come there in a moment. Um, I'm jumping ahead. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. In other words, the law keeping is no longer what will keep you? Consider the, how he will judge the righteous, but consider also how he's going to judge the rebellious. I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way that I am commanding you today to go after other gods that you have not known. The curse, if you do not obey. If you are rebellious. Here is the curse. What is the curse for the rebellious? Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you. And you will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain. Baal was the a primary god of the Canaanites and Baal was in control of rain. This is the differ this is the battle between Ahaz, king of Egypt, of Israel and Elijah. And Elijah prays and it stops raining. Why is that such a big deal? Because they served Baal, the God of rain. And the Lord said, watch this. I'll shut up the heavens and it won't rain for years until I say it will rain. Rain comes from God. He'll seal up the heavens if you don't obey him. And the land will yield no fruit. And you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. If you are not righteous... If you have not kept all the law with all of your heart, you will perish. This statement is absolutely applicable to everyone here right now. If you are not righteous, that is, if you have not kept all of the law with all of your heart, you will will perish. This is the standard of God. This is the law. 
Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, you must be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect if you are to enter the kingdom. This is the law. Unless Christ has justified you. Unless Christ has justified you. And here's where we come to that catechism question and we look at that same passage where in Galatians 2.16 we read, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law because you can't keep the law. And not by works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. If you are counting on your righteousness, if you are counting on your ability to keep the law, you will perish. But what does Paul say? But through faith in Christ Jesus, even we who have believed in Christ, that we may be justified by faith in Christ. And how does this happen? Because Christ kept the law. Christ kept the law for his people. He fulfilled every bit of it. He he didn't miss a jot or a tittle. Every bit of it he kept. And then he imputes that righteousness to his people. And he bears the penalty of their sin by dying on the cross and bleeding for them. Shedding his blood in payment of sin. And those who are in him have been imputed. That is, they've been given his righteousness. So you will stand before the Lord having or as if you had completed every bit of the law. If you are in Christ by faith. But you must believe him. You must cling to him for life. So consider your response. There's two potential responses here for us. Believe and love him. Believe and love him. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand. You shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul. That is to say, you should believe him from your heart. Lay them up in your soul. This is in, in the, throughout this uh, book, there's many references to disbelieving and believing, disbelieving and believing. Faith and laying up these words in my heart is the same thing. Believe, grab hold, believe from your heart. Bind them as a sign on your hand that they shall be frontlets between your eyes. Remember your devotion to him. This wasn't an act of just putting something on my head. It was an act of saying, Lord, help me remember my devotion to you. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Remember at home and remember out in the public square so that you might live righteously. Now this is to a people who are under the law, but for you and me, we remember what Christ has done. Remember the beauty of Jesus. And we write Jesus' name on our forehead and we write Jesus on on our doorposts and we put Jesus on the gates and we remember what he's done for us and we love him. And we serve him. Love him from your heart. You shall therefore love the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep the whole commandment. And if you will indeed obey my commandments to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart. You shall therefore lay these words of mine in your heart. You shall be careful to do all the statutes and rules that I'm setting before you today. Love and obedience are connected. Consider faith, love, and obedience cannot be pulled apart from one another. Faith, love, and obedience cannot be pulled apart. I love you, but I don't obey you. That's not, that, that's not true. Love and obedience come together, and they're married together by faith. Believe and love him or rebel and disown him. Believe and love him. These are the only two options. Take care, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Take care, lest your heart be deceived. Deception leads to disbelief. This is what the serpent is doing in the garden. Did you, did did God really say that? Do you really believe that that's what he said? Do you really believe that you're going to die? Do you really believe? It is a matter of faith. Deception leads to disbelief. And disbelief leads to rebellion as you turn aside. That's why he likes me. And serve other gods and worship. And rebellion then leads to rejection. Disbelief leads to rebellion. Rebellion leads to rejection. You serve and worship 
other gods. And this is precisely what happened to these people as they went into the land and they stopped believing and they turned aside and worshiped and served all of the other gods around them. And this is the risk to you and me. You and I are tempted to turn away from the Lord and to serve the gods of our world and our culture. So what's our response? There are only two ways to respond to the Lord. You either believe and love him or you doubt and disown him. These are the only two options. There's no middle way here. There's no third way. You either believe and love him or you doubt and disown him. This is so instructive for our culture who want to make multiple ways. There's only two ways, a way to life and a way to destruction, a way to the promised land and a way to perishing. So here's the question for us this morning. Which path are you taking? What is the path that you're on? Are you on the path of faith? By the way, just to remember that path of faith is saying, Jesus, I'm clinging to you for my hope. You are my righteousness. I am putting my faith in you and you alone. And I love you. And as a result of my love for you, I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. To not do that is to doubt and to disown. Jesus is the only way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes unto the Father but by him. Let's take a moment and give consideration to these things. We're going to pause. I'm going to pray. Then we're going to pause and we're going to reflect for a few moments on this. Um, We're going to leave, uh, if you would, Jared, leave those questions um, up there. Unless you have a slide on. uh, He might have a slide to put up on on what we do during this time. There it is. Let's go, Lord, in prayer, and then we'll take a few moments to pause. Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is truth to us in life. Lord, even as we think about Moses standing before these people so many years ago in a land very different from ours and a culture very different from ours and circumstances very different from ours. And yet, Lord, looking at their experiences and what you've taught them and putting that together with what you so graciously provided us through your apostles in the New Testament, Lord, we find such rich and deep help for us. Lord, help us to be cross-eyed. Help us to remember what you've done. And help us, Lord, also be looking ahead to what you will do. And Lord, may those things govern what we do now. Lord, may we be a people who love you, who believe you, who follow you. Lord, we thank you. And I pray as we meditate and think for a few moments and reflect, may you bring to mind Whatever each individual here needs to hear from you, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's just take a couple of moments, and then I'll come back up and close our time together.